Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, yeah, today I want to talk about Darwin and evolution. And evolution is one of the most important ideas in the history of science. And unfortunately, most of what most people have heard about Charles Darwin and the discovery of evolution is completely wrong. And that's not good enough. I study Darwin and the history of biology and the history of evolution, and it is one of my passions to try and share what I know, because the discovery and the, unve the, the unveiling of evolution is, a, is an incredible story. It's a part of all of us. It's our story, every one of us. It's where we come from and what we are. And not understanding that and not knowing anything about it, I think, is a shame. So I'll start with Darwin and how evolution was discovered. This is Charles Darwin as a young man. He lived from 1809 until 1882. But before I want to move on to what Darwin actually found out, there's a little bit of historical context or background that you must have in order to understand what Darwin did. Because the story I'm about to tell you is usually told a completely different way and completely wrong, which is something like this. Until Darwin published his Origin of Species in 1859, everyone thought the world was 6,000 years old and that uh, a supernatural being had created every species uh, on the earth at one time. That's false. That is not true. That was not the state of scientific knowledge when Darwin came along. And if you tell the story in that incorrect way, it's very difficult to understand how Darwin could have possibly done what he did. Technical difficulties. Anyway, um, and the, the, the main point is that the scientific community... Oh, gosh. There we go. The scientific community before Darwin, all religious men, not evolutionists, not atheists, had already figured out over the preceding decades that the Earth is unbelievably ancient, countless millions of years. None of them accepted that it was 6,000 years old. Unanimously um, accepted the world was very, very ancient. This was obvious to them after decades of studying the actual fabric of the Earth itself, the rocks. Layer upon layer were discovered, named, categorized. There were eras of life where the where the deposition was stacked on top with other layers that had been folded, eroded away, others deposited on top, on and on and on. Furthermore, they found that the sedimentary rocks containing fossil creatures showed not only that there were living things on the earth that are now gone, extinct things that no longer live in the world today, which was a big puzzle for a while. A lot of people didn't want to accept that. How could anything be created that no longer exists? But anyway, they found that the fossil record was progressive. And the most ancient rocks were the most primitive living things, and that as you moved through time up towards the present, creatures more and more similar to those alive today were present. So these two points are universally accepted before Darwin, that the world is unbelievably ancient, and that the history of life on Earth has been a progressive story. That was not evidence for evolution for these uh, pre-Darwinian scientists. They had other ways of explaining it, that there had been, for example, a series of creation events. And that's why uh, the fossil record looked the way it did. Anyway, the point I want to make is we're halfway to Darwin already with pre-Darwinian science. And this is a, these are two contemporary views of the progressive nature of the fossil record. Okay, Charles Darwin sailed around the world on board HMS Beagle, a surveying uh, vessel. The point of the voyage was to make maps, not to carry Charles Darwin around. Uh, in fact, it's very often said nowadays that Darwin wasn't really the naturalist on the Beagle, but in fact the ship's, um, the captain's companion. I think that's wrong. Darwin really was the naturalist on the ship. And furthermore, if he was supposed to be the captain's companion, he was a really bad one. Because he only spent 20% of the time on the ship. The rest of the time he was on land, mostly in South America, being a naturalist. And when he did so, he had one of these notebooks in his pocket, recording his scientific observations and uh, also some sketches. Now, Darwin famously couldn't draw to save his life, but I will show you just this one sketch, which is very special, in my opinion, because it is the only known self-portrait of Charles Darwin. There he is. 
in only time, the great man ever drew himself. Okay, so the Beagle uh, sailed to the Galapagos Islands, the most famous part of the, the Beagle voyage. Many people think Darwin just sailed to the Galapagos Islands. And when there, what happened? Or well, he had some sort of eureka moment when he saw the beaks of these finches and got the idea for evolution. That's completely wrong. Not only did Darwin not get the idea of evolution from the, seeing these finches, but when he was in the Galapagos Islands, he didn't even know they were all finches. He thought there were loads of different kinds of birds. They vary a lot. It's only when he got home that an expert ornithologist told him that they were finches. But these birds he did notice at the time, the mockingbirds. He noticed that on one island, the birds looked like this, on the next island, they looked different. And he noted that at the time. And it's these birds that are the basis of his first uh, recorded doubting about um, species staying the same over time. I don't know if you can read this. This page from his ornithological notes, where he says, if this is true about those mockingbirds being different on different islands, he says, um, if there is the slightest foundation for these remarks, the zoology of archipelagos will be well worth examining, for such facts would undermine the stability of species. Undermine the stability of species. Well, when, it was only actually when Darwin came home that he came up with this theory uh, to explain all of this. And he was asked in later years, what was it that uh, made him come up with this theory? He, never, he didn't say it was the Galapagos and the Finches. He always named three kinds of evidence. Number one, the discovery of extinct fossil mammals in South America that were puzzlingly similar, even related, to things that only live in South America today. There are many examples. This is just one, the glitidon with its bony external covering, and the armadillo, also with a bony armor on the outside. Now just to make this point a bit clearer, imagine Darwin is aware of the fact that these extinct things have only been found in this small part of the entire world, which is also, coincidentally, the only place that these relatives, or parent relatives, are found. Why should that be? Why should there be this similarity in the, in this, in the same place of, of similar creatures happening over time? Next was the puzzle of geographical distribution. There were many examples. I will just use this one of the, the rayas or ostriches. There were two species. Darwin found a new one. Why should it be that these very, very similar species, these, they, were, they looked like cousins, why should they have ranges that are but right the next one to another? Why should their ranges be right next to each other? Similar species right next to each other. The environment didn't seem to make that necessary. Next, the third thing he listed, third of three, was the Galapagos Islands. Now oh, there they are, 600 miles off the coast of South America. Darwin, as a geologist, could see that these were volcanic rocks that had erupted out of the ocean, originally bare, naked, and lifeless. So where did all the living things on these islands come from? Well, as a naturalist who has just spent the last few years in South America, it was absolutely obvious to him that these creatures had come from South America. They were obviously South American kinds of things, and not things that were, for some reason, created to go with volcanic islands, with volcanic rocks, which is what the existing theory of the day would have predicted, that living things were, by some means, created to suit the environment they lived in. Which is why, for example, when earlier eras of life were thought to have been swept away, perhaps they thought the Earth had changed so much that the earlier species, who were fixed within certain limits beyond which they could not change, when the environment changed too much for them, they died out. And some miraculous process created new life that fit the new environment. Well, here is a new environment, but the creatures living there are not created for volcanic islands. They're creatures like those in South America. How did they get there? Well, one theory was that they had all uh, migrated independently, each from South America to each individual island. Now, Darwin could see that that's an absurd uh, hypothesis. It's, not, it's just a ridiculous to think that every one, one of these birds or weeds had got all the way from South America only to one island. <laughs> that can't be. So instead, he thought, Sorry, I think I just zapped somebody in the eye with the laser pointer. <laughs> Instead, much simpler to think that a, a single migration process has happened to the islands of the Galapagos from South America, and then once in the islands, to migrate to other islands is a much simpler, more likely process. 
But somewhere in there, the only way this is recognizable, of course, was that they were different species on the different islands. So Darwin could see from all three of these kinds of formation that clearly species must change over time. And the Galapagos was a particularly clear case. So it was only when he got back to London and put all of the pieces together that he began to create his theory of evolution by branching descent. That is, that living species, like the finches or the mockingbirds, are related to one another along a, a branching genealogical tree, a family tree of life. This is one of the earliest ones in his notebooks. Well, while he was trying to explain how can this be, how can living things change, and more importantly, how can they become adapted to their particular environments? How can the um, mistletoe become adapted to feed on the sap of certain trees and require certain kinds of birds to eat their seeds to deposit them on other trees? Such a complex relationship couldn't be explained by any of the other uh, scientific theories that have been put forward, such as by Lamarck or the author of The Vestiges, that there was some sort of inherent law of progress that made things move forwards up some sort of cosmic scale. That couldn't explain such complex ecological relationships uh, for Darwin. And then he happened to read uh, the theorist Thomas Malthus uh, about the idea of geometrical population growth. And this is what really gave Darwin the key. Malthus was writing about human populations, but Darwin could see that this fit the entire natural world that any species that you choose, whether it be an orchid, peas, uh, sardines, anything, are reproducing at a rate that within a few hundred generations would utterly cover the globe. But they don't. The only reason that can be is that almost all of them are being killed, crushed, devoured, starved, eaten, etc. Therefore, Darwin thought, what is it about the few who don't get consumed? Only a few make it through this gauntlet of death. And those few are the ones that pass on their, their um, likeness to future generations. What was it about these? To find the clue to that, Darwin studied domestication. How is it that human breeders and farmers are able to create particular breeds with particular properties? This is one example from one of Darwin's books, one of my favorites. This is a kind of chicken called the Polish fowl. This is a fancy breed that people made. It's not a natural, naturally occurring breed. I like to call it a punk chicken because it has these huge <laughs> crests. And breeders made this by always choosing the one with the, that had slightly bigger, naturally, slightly bigger uh, crests, slightly bigger feathers. Here's a real one. So you can get a, a look at what uh, this is. Supposed to, that's actually, that was actually my own chicken until she was uh, naturally selected by a fox in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> they had nice eggs too. He also studied pigeons. Now, all the different kinds of pigeon breeds, and they still exist today, many people back then thought that each one was descended from its own wild ancestor, which conveniently didn't exist or, or had gone extinct. Darwin explained no, it must be that all of these different breeds are actually derived from the wild rock pigeon. That's the kind that's filling every square and city in the world today. That's the wild rock pigeon. Coincidentally, uh, the reason why our squares and cities are covered with those today is we don't eat them anymore. But a hundred years ago, there were no pigeons wandering around. And that's the reason. We don't eat them anymore. We have nicer food. So, oh, I'm stuck again. So, Darwin realized that selection uh, a, a version of the breeder's selection was the key. That through the ever-running process of unbelievable overproduction, <coughs> seeds, eggs, pollen, small squirrels, whatever it is, being produced in incredible numbers, all of them slightly varying, slightly different, never the same, just like us. And in the complex circumstances of life, anything that makes a difference to any of them actually getting through the gauntlet which Darwin called natural selection, which is actually not a thing, but a name for this broad basket of different kinds of causes and effects and complexities that lead to something getting killed off or not. Anything that leads one to have an edge to make it through is likely to be passed on to its offspring. And that tiny bit of change, that little bit of a bigger feather, which a breeder can see and select, 
It's the same kind of thing would happen in natural selection. And then you have to exercise the power of the ancient earth, the ancient age of the earth, but the power of endless time. These tiny accumulations of tiny changes can accumulate to create every species alive in the world today, every beautiful uh, and complex form that, is found, that has ever been found. So Darwin, after working for 20 years on this theory, and by the way, it's another myth that Darwin was afraid uh, to tell anyone what he believed. He told um, basically all of his uh, family, friends, neighbors, and colleagues that he believed in evolution during this long <coughs> period of time. And then in the end, he was prompted by another great naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was actually here in Singapore, and I'm start starting up a new project uh, called Wallace Online now, here at NUS. Wallace came up with almost the same idea and sent an essay to Darwin. Why did he send it to Darwin? Because he knew Darwin was working on the species question, and Wallace was planning someday when he got back to write a book on the subject. He didn't know uh, that Darwin had the same idea, but he did know Darwin was almost finished with his book. But Darwin was pretty surprised, but it turned out to be pretty much the same idea. And so Darwin, as a gentleman, handed the essay over to his colleagues who decided to publish extracts from Darwin and Wallace's essay together at the same, same time in a joint publication. This prompted Darwin to bring out, of course, his most famous book, The Origin of Species, published in 1859. And it's very often believed that when Darwin's book was published, there was a great public outcry, an outrage, there was a huge conflict of science and religion. Not really. Yes, there was a lot of controversy. Yeah, there was a lot of name-calling. But actually, the reaction was quite different than what most of us now think it was. And this is one of the most important messages I want to leave you with. And that is that within 20 years of the publication of The Origin of Species, the scientific debate about evolution was over. Over. It was done the international scientific community had accepted that evolution is true by the 1870s and moved on. So if you've heard, as I'm sure everyone listening to me has, that evolution is somehow controversial, uh, well, no, it hasn't been since the 1870s. There are more recent controversies, but those have erupted in the 20th century. This is a new movement, not a, 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 a still ongoing uh, problem or debate a question with Darwin ever since the beginning. It's a new movement. Uh, when Darwin, by the time Darwin died in uh, 1882, he was clearly remembered as uh, one of the greatest scientists who had ever lived. That's the way people describe him. This is the last line of The Origin of Species, which is quite poetic. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. And, and, and so it, that was how his memory was, was placed after he died. If you'd like to know more about Darwin, his complete works are available for free uh, on Darwin Online. Thanks very much.